The Holy Gospel, according to Luke, the 10th chapter. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest upon that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in that same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick who are there, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, on that day it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago sitting in sackcloth and in ashes. But at the judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted up to the heavens? No, you will be brought down to Hades. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. Whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over the powers of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated and let us open with a word of prayer. Good and gracious God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Another story. When I was 16 years old, I spent my junior year, the second half of my junior year, in West Germany. And I had an exchange student who'd come to live with me for the first semester, and then I went back to live with her. But I went on the plane by myself. I was kind of nervous. And I had gotten to know her family and was living with her family. And one day, I received a letter from home. I received a letter from my brother's girlfriend at the time 
that told me that they were engaged. And I was so excited because I just loved this young woman who was dating my brother at the time. And that I decided I wanted to tape the letter onto my wall. But I had never had wallpaper before. So I didn't fully understand the concept of wallpaper. So I taped the letter onto my wall. And, and then for some reason, I decided to take it off. And so I took it off the wall. And as you know, that happens with tape and wallpaper. Some of the wallpaper came off. And I was horrified. I was absolutely horrified because I'd ruined the wallpaper in my, in my wall. And I had lived long enough to know that your parents will always find out what you've done wrong. And so you need to just confess. But I also knew that it was a big deal to confess. And so there I was, nervous and in anguish and crying and a hot mess, as my sister-in-law likes to say. So I went up to my host father, Friedhelm, and I was in tears, and I told him what I'd done. I had ruined the wallpaper. I told him why I'd done it. I told him what I'd done. And he looked at me, and he said, Schätzchen, which means, like, lovely little one. And he gave me this giant hug. And I was like, what's going on? This is counterintuitive. And I was really confused. But my body sort of just sunk into this hug. And I needed it. And I knew that he knew that I had already held myself accountable. I had already been in anguish. And I also knew that he had already forgiven me. That it was not going to define our relationship. The... The courage that I'd had to actually state the truth, the compassion that he'd shown, to know that he didn't need to reprimand me, that that had been done, and that he could offer me forgiveness, led to a connection that was deeper than we would have had without that experience. Courage, connection, and compassion these are powerful things. Brene Brown is a, a researcher and author, and she has, uh, she has researched shame her whole career. And she talks about how much we can be paralyzed and controlled by shame. You know those feelings of shame? The ones that say that not just have I done wrong, I did something wrong, but that go further and say, I am wrong. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I'm lacking. I don't deserve to be here. I don't, forget. I don't deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve to be listened to. You know those feelings? How many of us have struggled with those feelings in our life? How many of us long to be freed from them, long to be able to go out into the sunlight and say, this is who I am. This is who I am. And you know what? I know that I have value. And I invite you to see it too. What would that be like if we could do that? What, if that? what would that be like if that truth of our own self-value and self-worth could move from our head to our heart? Well, Dr. Brown talks about the need for activate courage, compassion, and connection, and how it starts within our own hearts and within our own selves. In reading the scripture today, listening to Jesus gather together, not just the 12, but 70, 
gather them together and say to them, I'm going to send you out, but don't worry. I'm not sending you out alone. There are 70 of you. Don't worry. I'm not sending you out alone. You're going out in pairs. But let's be honest. I'm sending you like sheep into, sheep into the wolves. Well, that's not very helpful. <laughs> I'm about to send you out, and I just want you to know this is going to be really dangerous. I guess he speaks the truth, right? Because we all know that life is filled with dangers. Life is filled with those moments where people reject you. And he says that, doesn't he? He says, you're going to face rejection. He doesn't say, if you face rejection. He says, when you face rejection, shake the dust off your feet. When you offer peace to someone, when you offer peace to someone and it doesn't return to you, let that peace simply come back into your heart. Don't take their own anxiety, worry, rejection, and fear into your being. Shake it off like the dust. And then he says to them, but in those moments, in those moments where you find welcome, where you go without purse, without bag, without even feeling like you have anything to offer other than just plain yourself, when you find someone, embrace that and welcome that, offer that same message of peace. And offer to both communities the same message of hope that the reign of God, the kingdom of God, is near. Is near. The people that hear the message, they get to choose. They get to choose what kind of person and life they want to live and person they want to be. They get to choose what kind of community they want to live in. And we get to choose too. What kind of community do you want to be a part of? What kind of life do you want to live? Do we want to be defined by our our fear and our shame and our guilt? Do we want to share that with others? Brene says that in order to cultivate, to cultivate courage, which means from the Latin, speaking from the heart, speaking your truth from the heart, then we have to do something that, the, that our society tells us not to do. We have to let ourselves be vulnerable. It's not about us going out and pretending like we have all the answers. It's about us going out and recognizing that we are imperfect and broken. And in the midst of that beautiful imperfection, God chooses to work through us. So we can be vulnerable. It takes more courage than pretending like we have all the answers. She says, for cultivating compassion, you know, it's really interesting what she says it needs to start with. Guess what it needs to start with? Boundaries. I love that. She says, to really be able to cultivate compassion, we need to be able to set up some boundaries. Again, when Jesus sends the disciples out, he says to them, don't take into your heart everything that other people are feeling. Remember, there's a distinction between you and them. You are not the same person. You're called to, to show them compassion, which means to suffer with, to walk alongside. But you are not called to suddenly be them. You're called to be your own self. And sometimes that means saying, no, I need a rest. Sometimes that means saying, no, this is something I can't offer to you. Just this last week, somebody said to me, you know, you, 
and another person in your congregation, I asked you for this and you said no. And I said, you're right. I said no, because that's not something I can offer you. But let me tell you what I can offer you. Here's how I can walk with you in this journey. And I laid it out. And I said, I could try this and I could try this. What do you think about that? OK. End of story. And then she says to cultivate connection. To cultivate connection, we need connection is being able to actually be seen and heard and valued by another person. Again, it takes vulnerability, it takes boundaries, and it takes courage. She says these are practices that we can cultivate. What is an obstacle for you to cultivating courage? To living with compassion? To connecting with others? What are some obstacles that you found that you face? Just think for a minute. How is God calling you to move past these obstacles? What kinds of things can we do? How can we, how can we not even maybe do, but simply be? I'll tell you, um, one of the obstacles I found for myself is that I get hectic and I get busy. And when I get hectic and I get busy, I get less rest. And when I get less rest, I get less patient. And when I get less patient, I get hard on myself. And when I get hard on myself, I get defensive if anybody points out that, hey, pastor, you said you're going to do this and you didn't do this. Well, come on, I can't do everything. It's a spiral. Does anybody else recognize that? Am I the only one that does that? Okay. <laughs> it felt really strange to me to spend 11 days at a clergy spiritual <laughs> renewal retreat, right? I told the council, I said, I'm going to continuing education. I'm going to go spiritually renew myself. <laughs> well, how is that helpful to the church? <laughs> and I thought, well, OK. And they said, well, why did you come? And I said, well, to be honest with you, I was pretty desperate because this came across my desk two days before my mentor died. And so after he died, I said, sure, I'll go. I'm sure I'm going to need something because I've lost a lot. And that's the only reason why I said yes. And so there I was in Madison, and we, 19 of us, we showed up. And boy, we're, we're us pastors. Boy, did we carry wounds with us. Every single one of us had a story to share. Every single one of us shed tears. And every single one of us ended that week feeling alive again. The, at the end of the week, some of the community members that heard us say what we'd gotten out of it said, you're like, you were like Moses coming down from the mountaintop with your face shining and glowing because you'd seen God. And I thought, yeah, I felt that way. And you know what? I don't know if any of us knew how much we needed that. To be honest with you, when I think about wanting to try to cultivate courage and compassion and connection, I want to think about all the things that I should be doing. But what I learned over the course of that last week is that what I need is more time to rest. What I need is to actually say that when I take my morning walk, it's going to make me a better pastor. When I pray to God, it's going to make me a more compassionate person of faith. It's worth it for me to take care of myself. And it's worth it for me to say no if I can't do one more thing in order to make time to 
take care of myself. It's not selfish. It's the most important, and as Sister Denise said, the most unselfish work that we're ever going to do. Can we give ourselves permission to take a rest? When the kids need one more thing, when the congregation needs one more thing, when your work needs one more thing, can you kind of figure out your priorities? Figure out a time to say yes when you can, a time to say no when you have to, and, and carve out time for yourself. We get to decide every day, not just what kind of person we want to be and life we want to live, but what kind of community we want to be. And as we celebrate the 4th of July, the world, the nation, will often tell us that if we pretend to be the strongest, toughest, smartest, richest in the world, then we're going to somehow be good enough. But Jesus sends us out two by two, knowing that we need each other, knowing that we can support each other, and knowing that, you know what, we come with not very much in our hands. Because sometimes the most we have to offer is revealed when we have the least baggage in our hands. And so now, children, beloved children of God, I am going to give you a little worksheet for you to take home and just think to yourself about these ideas of courage, compassion, and connection. How do you cultivate them? How do you take time for yourself? How do we decide to be a community where we have God's peace and the vision of God's kingdom of courage, connection, and compassion to offer the world? And now may the peace of Christ, which surpasses all human understanding, Guard your hearts and your minds in the same Christ Jesus, now and always. Amen.